in history, he says, if you wish to know God, you must know his word. If you wish to perceive his power, you must see how he works by his word. If you wish to know his purpose before it comes to pass, you can only discover by his word. And so here, Charles Spurgeon is encouraging us. If we want to have a fruitful life in which God is blessing us and we're able to understand why he does the things that he does, and if we want to know our purpose for all these things, we got to be spending time in the Bible. And so that's my encouragement to all of you this week. Um, and so today's sermon, I want this to be able to impact your head and your heart and your hands. So it's really important for us to know his word, but we also have to let this word uh, flow into our heart so that our hands can be transformed because of that. We must be doers of that. And in order to be doers of those words, we have to apply God's word. And so what are we to do with God's word? We are to listen to it. Yes, that's really important. That means the same thing we mean as parents when we say to our children, listen to me. But really when you say to your kids, listen to me, you want them to listen but really, what you want them is to do it. It doesn't mean to hear the words and then forget about it. It means to hear the words and apply it into their lives. It means to hear and to obey. And so the only way for us to be able to uh, be obedient to God and his word is for us to take the word and actually apply it into our life. So this is today's comic. It says, with the cost of living going up on everything, aren't we glad God hasn't uh, raised the tithe to 20%? Right? <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Can you imagine if, if God was to give us a yearly report? If God can send that report every year from heaven to all the pastors and, say, and God said, say, oh, you know what? Because of inflation this year, you're going to have to say the tithe is no longer 10%. Now it's going to be 20%. But God hasn't done that yet, okay? All right, but if he did, yeah, who knows what we would be paying, right, you guys? Okay, all right. So anyways, we are on our sermon series. This is the A, B, C, D, E of generosity. And so for today's sermon, I have titled this Believe and Generosity. So uh, the sermon question that I asked myself is this. What happens if I give my tithes and offerings and I end up homeless? So when I was just coming into the faith, when I was starting to come to really know God, you know, people would be talking about the tithe and your financial givings to God. And as a newer believer, I just thought, boy, but what happens if I give all this money and I give so much of it away that I end up becoming homeless? Well, you know what? Maybe you've asked yourself that question too. What happens if you give your tithes an offering and you end up being homeless? And so that's the question that I want us to ponder and think for today's sermon. And so if there's only one thing that you can walk away and remember from today's entire sermon, it is really simple. It is this. Believe that God's got your back. I want you to know that God has your back. He is never going to fail you. He is never going to abandon you. He is never going to leave you. If there's one thing that you can take away from this entire sermon, God's got your back, all right? And so this is my disclaimer, and I'll say it this entire month. As the pastor of the cross, my disclaimer is I don't get paid by you. Uh, I don't get a salary. I've never gotten a check. I'm not asking so that you can get more money so that I can get more money in my pocketbook. That's not it. Uh, Elder Ed has never written a check to say, Pastor Yao, here is your salary check. That's never happened before. Here's my elder disclaimer. This is the only month out of the entire year that you will hear me preach about generosity by giving. So, you know what, if this is your first time here at the cross, I know that all of you, sometimes as churches, we get really bad rep. Oh, those pastors are just always asking for money. And this happens to be your first time at the cross. And unfortunately, it has to be the month in which the pastor is talking about generosity. I want you to know that, you know what, this only happens one month out of the entire year. You're not going to hear me preach about generosity until next year. So only this month 
that I get this opportunity to do that. Generosity, this is not something that I want from you, but instead, this is something that I want for you. And so it's really important that this isn't so much me or Elder Ed saying, we want your money, but instead, it's not what we want from you. We want for you to have generosity in your heart. So with that, uh, to get us started here today, uh, I want you guys to meet Bob, okay? So here is Bob. Meet Bob. Bob's been coming to church for a while now. Amidst the busyness of work and life, he wants to grow closer to the Lord. But he feels like something's missing. He reads his Bible, well, sometimes. He's attending a home <coughs> and even listening to podcasts of old sermons. But try as he might, he just feels like something's missing. Then Bob heard a teaching on giving financially. He felt a little convicted, knowing that he and his family were not regularly tithing 10%. But he wondered, does God really command me to give the first 10% of the church? Does the church really even need the money? Or what's in it for me? Why should I give? Bob decided to dig a little deeper and look into it for himself. So he opened his Bible and really didn't know where to look. So he Googled Bible passages about money. He was very surprised to find a large number of verses about tithing. And not just in the Old Testament. Jesus himself taught about tithing to the local church. And now Bob was really feeling convicted. He was beginning to see why the tithe was so important. It wasn't about the church needing money or trying to scam him in some way. It was a question of the heart. Bob repented of his disobedience and he started to return the first 10% of his income to God. He was pleasantly surprised to see breakthroughs in many areas of his life, his relationship with his children, his marriage, and even his finances began to improve. Bob thought back to one of the verses that he'd read about the time. Test me in this, says the Lord and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out my blessing upon you. All right, so uh, just a quick little video to get us to think a little bit about generosity through time. All right, so last week we talked about A for always, and so this week the B for generosity is to believe. And so uh, I find it really interesting when I talk to some people about uh, generosity and tithing, uh, how some people feel about giving God his portion. So remember last week we said that God owns what? He owns everything. Uh, and I gave you guys a litany of Bible verses to say, nothing really belongs to you. God owns everything. God has just given us your kids, your house, your car, your finances so that you can be a steward, a caretaker of his blessings that he has given for you. But this is how some people feel about giving God his portion. Right here. It's like, oh no, like I gotta give him everything. And if I give him everything, I am going to have nothing. And people are in tears to think, oh, like if I give him all of this, I'm going to have nothing. And I want you to know that this is the wrong way for you to think about generosity. That's not it, okay? God is not asking for you to give all your money to Him. Alright? So, we're not saying that you got to give everything. It is not your 100% tithe. Your tithe is your 10%. He's only asking for a tithe and or an offering, okay? So he's asking for a tithe or an offering. So let us start off first with a tithe, all right? So just so that everybody has that basic understanding of a tithe, your tithe is your one-tenth or it is your 10%. In the Bible, the very first time we hear about tithing or a 10%, it is found in Genesis chapter 14, and this is with Abram, okay? So Abram is Abram before he was called Abraham. And so it says, Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. 
Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. So, like in the Bible, this is the first time we hear of a tenth. And so God blessed Abraham to get all these things. And so here Abraham's like, God, you blessed me with so much. I'm going to give you a tenth. In the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, here Jesus talks about a tithe. It says, Jesus says, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe. So this is Jesus saying, yes, it is important for all of us to tithe. And so 10%, okay, if you are blessed with $10 you would tithe to God one dollar for a ten percent. If God blessed you with a hundred dollars, you would tithe to God ten dollars. And if God blessed you with ten thousand dollars, you would tithe to God one thousand dollars. And if God blessed you with one hundred thousand dollars, you would tithe to God ten thousand dollars. Now, if you happen to be that individual in that last category where you've got 100000 we need to talk, okay? <laughs> All right, we need to talk because as you guys just heard, Ed says, we need new asphalt in that parking lot, okay? <laughs> and so, yeah, okay? Here's some facts about tithing that you might not know. Number one, tithers make up only 10 to 25% of any church. So the vast majority of people do not tithe. Less than a quarter of the church people actually tithe. Most people do not give their one-tenth. Eight out of ten people who give to churches have zero credit card debt. Well, pastor, I can't tithe because I've got this debt. Well, it actually turns out, according to statistics, people have researched this. Eight out of ten people who say that they have debt, they actually really don't have debt. That becomes their excuse as to why they're not wanting to be generous. Tithing is down 50% since 1990. And so in the last 30 years, especially in the Christian faith and in the churches, we've only seen tithing decrease each and every year. Number four. On average, Christians give 2.5% of their income to churches. Now, let's do the math on that, right? Let's do the math on that. So when people actually tithe, what percentage are they actually short? 7.5. So when people say, all right, I'll give, if we were to actually count up their generosity for the entire year, based on their income, they're actually only tithing, well, not even tithing, they're only being generous with 2.5% of their income. Last but not least, people who attend 27 or more church services a year give an average of 2,935 to charity. All right, so that, that's good. People are giving to the Humane Society and things like that, United Way. That's all good. But it actually turns out that uh, more of the, the person's income is actually going to these things than what God is first asking for. More people are willing to give to these community organizations than to their very own church. All right. Uh, hey, what's happening at the cross? Um, I'm not really sure. Um, I don't know all the numbers. Ed knows all the numbers. It is, it is not up to me to know the numbers. That's, God for, that's up to God to do. But if you want to know tithing here at the cross, here's what I can tell you. 
There are some people that regularly tithe that have never set foot into our church. They've only heard about our church and the awesome work that we do, and they just feel convicted to be generous to support our church's ministry. Wow. Um, some people that regularly tithe, I've never met them. Wow. Yeah, they just send us their tithe. They never enter through that door. What are your thoughts? Joan? I think it um, speaks to kind of how I feel about the cross and that they see that there's something really growing from this small church. Mm -hmm. That big things are going to come. Yeah. And that they want to be to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. they, they sense it. And okay. I think when people are convicted in their hearts, they that something something really good is coming. Amen. They want to feed into it. So yeah. I that's how I it gives me goosebumps because I um, that's truly how I I feel about the cross. Amen. Yeah. You know, I think uh, when something good is happening, I think people want to be a part of that, right? Yeah. And even if they're not physically here to be a part of that, they're like, I can still help out in this way. Yeah. And for some of these people, they live out of state, Bless you. and they're still generous, regular tithers, even though they've never been here. What are some of your other thoughts about that? I don't know if you guys knew about that. Laura? I think they realize that the need in this world and they know that we're trying to help those people. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they might even have people in their own lives that need that kind of help. Okay, yeah, Good for point. sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Milton? Yeah, before Jesus led me here, I was one of those people that wasn't attending church, but I saw evidence of things other pastor was doing in different states and I would send my money out like that. So I understand that. All right. Yeah. Awesome. So you don't see the action or you hear about it. Mm -hmm. When I first, before I met you, I saw some things that you was doing. Uh-huh. Then you kept moving around. So I said, Lord, you gonna bless him with the church of his own? Or he just gonna be like an evangelist? At first I thought you were just building things. <laughs> Bridge Street, I mean your home then Bridge Street in downtown. I said, well, you try to get to City Hall and do something there, too. Uh -huh. And then I realized he was doing something totally different. And the Lord said, you need to hook up with him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want you to stay out of my closet, too, man. We got always matching up. Here. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> Great minds think alike. Yeah, this is the kind of past I can deal with. Go <laughs> with, keep with, yeah. and we talk about it all the time. Amen. Awesome. Okay. The man of God's faith. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else want to chime in? Okay. Sam? Uh, I just think, I believe that they uh, have, uh, they're do, they, they do what they do to uh, help others to, um, you know, uh, know the Lord more and knowing yeah. that they can't physically be there to help in any way uh -huh. they just hope that hopefully this uh, you know this little money could assist you, know, you the church everyone yeah. to kind of you know get everybody to come to church more and yeah. uh, just to know the Lord really yeah so so here's my challenge for all of you guys if there's people that's not even coming to the church if there's people that's not even step foot in this church but they are so faithful to be giving their tithings. What about us that are coming here? Um, how generous and how faithful are we that we, we, we get a place to be able to, to do that? Okay? But seriously, I don't even have 10% to give because. So sometimes I, I hear this. Well, I just don't have any money at all, Pastor Yao. Like, I would like to, but I just don't have any money. Okay? So, I guess, um, you know, th those are some of the reasons. Now, how many of us have ever been guilty of this? 
So if you're saying, well, I don't have any money to give, how many of you guys have, you know, just humble yourself and, and think about this. Think about this right here. Oh, sorry, I am a student or I am a whatever. Whatever you want to put in there for, for your position. I don't really have anything left over to give. You know, right? Yep. But they get the fast food, right? They get the nice upgraded phones and they get their Starbucks. It's like, yeah, I don't got no money to give to the church. But you also then have to do a personal inventory of your finances to say, you know, like, is part of the reason why I don't have any funds to give to the church is because I'm not managing God's money very well. Or is it, well, I can't give any money to the church, but you like to splurge when it comes to clothes or shoes or whatever. Or you love the candy snack aisle a little bit too much. Okay? <laughs> or you love going to the movies. You love saving all that money for the vacations. You love the convenience of online shopping. So your money flies really fast because online shopping is way too easy now. And at the end of the week, you look at your account and you're like, yep, see God, I don't have any money left. It's all gone. Mm. Yeah, okay. So giving a tithe requires two changes. I wanna maybe test out the congregation. Who thinks they can fill this in for me? Think about this. If you want to be a regular tither, that requires two changes. What are those two changes? Throw them out there. What do you guys think? Okay, say. Your faith. Okay, maybe your faith. And what else? Sacrifice. Sacrifices. Anything else? Joan? I think you have to see everything as from God. That God is all God. Okay, all right, it's all God. Laura? And to put God first. God first? Okay, Milton? It's God's money anyway, so you got to learn how to turn it loose. But we hold on to it because of this selfish image we carry about ourselves. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay, anyone else? Ania? <laughs> I was going to say, you can't bring that money with you when you're dead, so... <laughs> yep. you don't all We're all dead. Place. We're all going to go in the same place. That's it. Okay. It's like a change of heart. Yeah. Okay. So giving it time requires two changes. And the first one, it's really, really, like, simple. It's just a lifestyle change. What does that mean? Well, it means that, like, maybe sometimes you can't go to McDonald's. Maybe sometimes on Friday you can't go to the movie theaters. Maybe you can't always be getting the best brand name shoes. Maybe that means you need to do a little Goodwill shopping, okay? All right? So, so that requires a lifestyle change. Maybe you're used to having it like this. And maybe it doesn't always need to be high and mighty. Maybe you can go for the less brand name stuff, okay? So lifestyle changes also means maybe you got to stop going to the casino. Maybe lifestyle change means you got to stop buying them lottery tickets. Maybe lifestyle change means you got to stop going to the bars. Maybe lifestyle change means you got to stop visiting the potato chips aisle. <laughs> maybe lifestyle change means you got to do less online shopping. So maybe I got to use my phone a little bit less because I'm too tempted to do online shopping when I'm online and you have the convenience of a phone or whatever it is. There's so much changes that we can do in our life so that at the end of the week or at the end of the month we can say god i got something left for you 
and said, I've got, I ain't got nothing left because I used it all for my personal lifestyle that might be a little bit too classy, might be a little bit too expensive, all right? And then the second one, and this is what I truly believe in. When it comes to generosity and tithing, it is not a financial issue. It's never a financial issue. It's a spiritual, heart, faith issue. That's what it comes down to. None of us are living under the bridge. Okay? So it's not that we don't have money. We do have money. But it comes to your spiritual faith, your trust, your heart to say, if I give to God what is already His, I have faith and trust that, you know what? God's going to be there for me. He ain't going to lead me to be homeless or anything like that. Okay? So that's tithing. It's giving your 10% to God. And then, now let's talk about offering. So, you know, we talk about tithes and offering. Both of these are used together, but both of them are different. Your tithe is your 10%. Now your offering, this is anything extra that you give beyond your tithe. And so it's your 10% and more. So, what, how does the offering here at the cross, how does that look like? So I want to let you guys know about this. We have some individuals that have blessed our church with their tithes and their offerings. This is the sole reason why we have our church building today. So remember... 10 to 25% of people only regularly tithe. And how we got this building, nobody just said, hey, Pastor Yaw, heard you were looking for a building. Here's a free building. All you got to do is occupy it tomorrow. Man, I wish life was that good, right? Okay? The reality is, this place isn't cheap. Okay? But we got a very good deal for it. But the only reason why we were able to get this is because someone or someones said, I'm going to give to the cross my tithe, but I also want to give to them my offering. So the only reason why we're able to be here today is because someone or someones here at this church says the cross means so much to me that I'm willing to go above and beyond my tithe and give my tithe and my offering. So to that person, thank you so much for your generosity. We would not be here in this church building today if it were not for your kindness and your generosity to the cross. May God bless you so mightily. And why do I say this? I say this because the cross, we started with, At least what? Nothing. Okay? We started the cross with nothing. So I guess to be a little bit more exact, we didn't have a church. So we had my house. And so, you know, like, before I became a pastor, you know, when you think about churches and pastors, you're like, oh, well, pastors, they have churches, and churches have pastors. <laughs> right? That's how it works. So in my novice thinking, I'm like, well, I don't want to be a pastor, but I don't have no church. <laughs> Pastors need a church. And so I went to God. And I said, hey, God, if you want me to be a pastor, I need a church. And God says, ah, hold up. Look what I did to Moses. I told Moses, Moses, I want you to do this. I want you to lead my people out of Egypt. Moses didn't get all the U-Hauls that he wanted. They're like, guys, put everything in the U-Hauls. We're getting out of here. God didn't give Moses the U-Hauls. 
What did God give to Moses? God gave to Moses a stick. <laughs> All right? God gave to Moses a staff. And from that staff, God was able to do wonders and miracles with a stick. And that's all that Moses had. So then God says, well, yeah, you ain't got no church building, but you got a building? It's like, God, I got my house. I got a four-bedroom by level in Weston. So God says, start it there. So we started the cross right there at 3907 Howland Ave in Weston. And from there, people started to believe about what we were doing. Slowly but surely, the tithes came, the people came, and the offerings started to come. And then, this is kind of the sad story. So then I said, hey, Ed. So I said to him last year, I said to Ed, I'm like, Ed, can you go and talk to the bank? We're just really done with renting, okay? <laughs> renting is no good. We need to get a building so we can stop throwing our money away. Because we're renting here, and then we're going here, we're renting there, and we're just throwing all this money away. And, you know, poor Ed, he is pretty much my slave, and I make him do everything. <laughs> so I said, Ed, go and talk to the bank, and he came back. And he pretty much said, the bank pretty much laughed at me. Aww. Yeah, and so he, he felt belittled because they're like, you're not in any position. So the, this was just last year. The bank came back and said, you are in no position to buy a building. Let's not even go there at all. Like, we're not even going to proceed with this conversation anymore. Because they looked at our finances and said, uh, this ain't going to happen. So, yeah, that was what happened last year. And then this year, look what we got. Here we are. Here we are. Yes. God is so good, right? You guys, come on, round of applause, man. Yes. How does this happen? This happens because we believe that it's important for us to be here in this community, to have a building, to have ministries, to reach those that need help. And the only way for that to happen is that we are faithful in our tithings and in our offerings to say, yes, we must continue the mission of the cross. And it is to go make and multiply disciples of Jesus Christ by living out love, faith, and grace. This happens because in our heart and in our bank account, both of those align so that we can say we believe in what's happening here. So thank you, everyone. This is our church. Let's do our part to keep it going so that the gospel message is continued to able to be spread. And that gospel message, it is that Jesus loves you. You see, you know, God is asking only 10% of us. That's it. God is saying, give me 10%. But when it time, but when it came for God. To really be a person of his word? God didn't say to humans, well, I'm going to give you 10% of me to you. Uh -uh. God said, I'm going to give you everything to you and that everything was his son, Jesus Christ. And if Jesus was willing to say, you are just not worth 10%, you're worth 100% to me, and that's my son, Jesus Christ. And, and God is asking only 10% of us. I don't think that's asking a whole lot when God gave everything and he's only asking 10%, okay? So one genuine fear that people have about generosity, like, I get it. I truly get it. People are really afraid that if I am going to give money, that I am going to end up being homeless. I told you guys this last week. I have yet to meet one person that's come to the cross and say, Pastor Yao, here's my 10%. And the next week, they're like, hey, Pastor Yao, I can't come to church. I'm actually homeless living under the bridge now. Because I gave you that 10%. Okay? That's never happened before. And I truly believe that'll never happen. 
Why? Why do people have that misconception? It's all fear. fear. That's what it comes down to. People are fearful that like, oh, if I give that dollar, that $10, that $100, I am going to become broke, homeless, without a house, without a car. My kids are going to have clothes. That's all fear. This is my definition of fear. Fear is misuse of the imagination. Fear is what if. Well, what if I give that $10, but after that, what if I don't have any more money to pay that bill? What if, what if, what if? That's what fears are, okay? It is a misuse of the imagination. So for example, this is just like a little kid example. Fear is this. Fear is a little kid. Oh, like what happens if, what if there's a monster under my bed? And guess what? There is no monster under your bed. But little kids have that fear because their imagination is being misused. There is a monster underneath their bed when in fact there is no monster. It's a misuse of the imagination. All right, so now I'm gonna put myself out there for you guys, okay? When it came to my financial fears, man, I was really afraid of starting in the church. Why do I say this? Because like, I could barely afford to pay my mortgage, my bills. You know, I got six kids. And I first started as a teacher, making $34,000 a year. Well, imagine $34,000 trying to feed all these moths. That's not going to go really far. And so here God was saying, hey, I want you to build this church. And I'm thinking, that's going to require finances, and I can barely afford to do all my bills. So what did I have to do? I had to make a leap of faith with my finances to say, God, if it is your will for me to start up this church, I am going to be faithful with my 10% and that you are going to bless it. And guess what? Bless it he has. Okay? So my family, we have never been homeless after I started the cross. Okay? Now, before I started the cross, when I was in college, there were some pretty difficult times, all right? But when we started the cross and I was faithfully giving, I had no issues trying to support my family. Okay? All right. So, like, what about, like, just my house? Because when I was giving more money into my offerings, now I was afraid that, like, boy, what happens if I just don't have enough money to pay my mortgage? Well, you know what? Like, six years later now, so the church is almost... Um, Wait, the church is almost five years now. And I was afraid financially when we first started that life. What happens if we lose this house? And it actually turns out that last year, God blessed us with like a bigger, better house. So the more that I was giving to God, the more that he was even blessing me with. Ain't that kind of cool? All right. So then... I also thought, man, I'm just a teacher. If I start giving God all this money, I might have to pick up a second job just so that my family is going to continue to live and survive. God's been so good. In fact, I've came to realize that, you know what? God's actually going to be giving me a better job. And so today, I'm also currently the executive director of the Gospel TLC. Yeah. So, like, I thought I'm going to have to pick up just another job just so that I can support my family. And recently, God's like, no, y'all, you don't have to do that. I'm actually going to give you a better job than being a teacher. And you're going to really be doing the things that you've always been wanting to and everything's gonna be even that much more better. 
So I was afraid that if I was going to give my tithes and my offerings, that my family was going to be homeless. Never happened. And today we have a roof over our head. It might not be the biggest palace that I've seen in my life, but you know what? It does its job to provide shelter and safety for my family. And that's all that I need, okay? So all my fears about giving money to God, all of those fears was for absolutely nothing because it never came to fruition. Those were just misuse of my imagination. What happens if I lose my job? What happens if I lose my house? None of those things happen. In fact, the more that I gave to God, the more blessings that he returned in part of that. So in Luke chapter 12, okay, so Jesus talks about all those things. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food uh, food to eat or enough uh, clothes to wear. For life is more than food and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for God feeds them, and you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Um, the last time that I checked, all of us are what? Believers. All of us are believers. So here, the Bible is saying, don't you be worried about these things. This is what unbelievers worry about. Like, I hate to say this, but unbelievers worry about COVID. Because they don't know what's going to be happening. We believers, we don't have to worry about COVID. Because God's got us. He said he's going to take care of the lilies. He's going to take care of us. In all the world, but your Heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. If you would just give to God what is his, the Bible here tells us, he's going to give you everything that you need. It is that plain and simple. Because here at the end, every form of currency that we have in the U.S. currency, every form of currency, it says, in God we trust so when you give that dollar to God, you're saying, hey, God, I trust you. I'm giving you my dollar, my hundred, or whatever. That's what it means. In God, we are trusting with our finances. And God will bless you. Okay? God's got your back. All right? So uh, here at the end, uh, I'm going to bless you guys with uh, two inspiration. This first one. This is called, He Made Too Much Money to Tithe, okay? The story goes like this. Uh, W.A. Criswell, uh, so he's a famous pastor of a long time ago. He also, uh, he told about an ambitious young man who told this pastor that he promised God a tithe of his income. And so then they prayed for God to bless his career. So this guy pretty much said, hey, pastor, I'm starting a career, can you just... Have God bless me so that I can get more money. And at that time, this man that went and asked the pastor to bless him with more money, with a better job, when that first happened, he was only making $40 per week. And because of that, he was only tithing how much? $4. In a few years, his income increased, and his tithing now became $500 per week. So... One day, the young man called on the pastor to see if he could be released from his tithing promise, for it was too costly now. He was making so much money now, and his one-tenth tithing was costing him $500 a week. So this guy was making so much money that his one-tenth every week, it had to be, $500 every week. And now he wants to go to, to say to the pastor, hey, Pastor, 
can I be released from my, you know, my one-tenth commitment? Because, you know, $500, that's, that's a lot to give up. I, I don't think I can do that anymore. The pastor replied, well, I don't see how you can be released from your promise, but we can ask God to reduce your income back to $40 a week, and then you would have no problem tithing $4. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, what a deal, right? Okay. So either you commit to your one-tenth, or I could go back up to God and be like, God, he's not willing to do that. So let's, let's go back to that original tithe. Let's go back to $4, okay? All right. And if you have any questions about, you know, the Gospel TLC, you know, at the church, feel free to just talk to me. All right, so with that, um, okay, I want you to think about this. What fears do you have when it comes to tithing or offering? We've been talking about fears, okay? Maybe you kinda, you've been kind of holding back a little bit. So I want you to think about this question. What fears do you have when it comes to tithing and offering? Please pray and pray for about a minute for that, please. All right, so here at the end, this is the reason why our sermon question is, what happens if you give your tithes and offering and you end up homeless? Believe that God's got your back. That's never going to happen, okay? And that's the reason why today's sermon title, We Have to Believe and Show Generosity. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for bringing everybody here to church today. Lord God, whatever fears that, um, that the people here at church today, whatever fears that they might have about uh, tithing or giving up offerings, Lord God, I would just ask that you would just make it abundantly clear in their heart, Lord God, that you are never going to fail them, abandon them, or leave them. But in fact, Lord God, you're just going to show them more blessings if they would just trust and have faith in giving to you what is already yours. Lord God, we pray these things in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen.